The metabolism has been extensively studied by science, but what if they were missing the key thing when it comes to having a healthy metabolism. Stay tuned to today's episode for more. Welcome back to the Evolving Wellness Podcast. Today I have Dr. Alexis Cowan on the podcast who actually did her thesis on metabolism and has had years and years of study in this particular department. But about a year ago, she discovered circadian biology and quantum biology and completely shifted her views on everything science related. And again, this is after years and years of study, of schooling and getting an actual PhD on these topics. So I was super excited to bring her on to today's show and really unpack this and to see how she's applying this information, not only on herself, but also with her clients. There's so much in this episode that I think you're gonna enjoy, so stay tuned. Just a quick little note before we get into today's episode, if you are new to the channel or new to this information, you can always get my free guides and my free resources on my website, www.sarahclinerwellness.com. And if you are a subscriber to the podcast, you can save 10% on any of my courses using the code podcast. That is also on my website, so make sure to check those out. I also have just released a new program called the Leptin Master Plan, which is more for people who are really interested in diving deeper into the science of a lot of the things that Dr. Alexis and I speak about today in relation to leptin, circadian biology, and quantum biology. The course is a little bit geared more towards practitioners, but it's also available for people who just want to understand and apply this information on a deeper level. So make sure to check that out on my website under courses. Let's go ahead and jump into today's episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Evolving Wellness Podcast. I am so excited for today's guest. We were just talking a little bit before I hit the record button. She's got a really, really interesting take on integrating circadian biology and quantum biology, but she's also uh, qualified to speak on these things. She's done a lot of research. She has really educated herself. And so I'm excited to have you here today, Alexis. I'm excited to be here. I've been a follower of yours for a while, and I think it's going to be so fun to connect. I think we've got a lot in common, and I'm excited to explore these topics with you. Yay, I'm excited too. Well, well, let's just jump into it. If you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself, your background, and uh, we'll just go from there. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, my background kind of stems back even maybe to my childhood, let's say, because in first grade, I had a lot of issues with chronic recurring strep throat. Um, even prior to that, I had a lot of dental issues when I was like two years old and I had a very traumatic dental surgery experience when I was two that kind of, I would say, in a lot of ways shaped the way that I viewed medicine um, and like a distrust in medical, like quote unquote, authority figures. Um, I think I also just have always kind of had a disdain for authority figures in general. But maybe that's another story. So uh, needless to say, I had a lot of health issues and challenges as a child. And after that strep throat like that recurring strep throat period of time in first grade, um, I was pulled out of school and homeschooled for about a year and a half because my mom was like, you know, you keep getting sick. Maybe it's at school or whatever. So I'm at home and after a bit on antibiotics for multiple months at a time and now actually reflecting back on that time, I also feel that I probably had black mold in my house that was contributing to this. Yeah. And during that period of time where I was at home, my weight just kind of spiraled. And when I went back to school in third grade, I was weighing about double my classmates. And then that continued to escalate up through around sophomore year of high school, where I, I clocked in somewhere around 270 pounds or so. And I dealt with a lot of upper respiratory health issues and skin infections and um, like irregular periods and just was not in a good place mentally or physically and did what I could at the time, which was basically like diet and exercise focus. So I ended up joining a gym with my friend and we went every day for like a year straight and I was counting calories super strictly. Um, no concept of food quality at this point, but just, you know, quantity wise, I was restricting and that actually looks like quite a bit of processed foods because if you're eating foods with labels, it tends to be easier to count, you know, yeah. so that's I an unfortunate that reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. But so during that year, um, year and a half, let's say after I committed to, you know, changing my diet, changing my exercise habits, I lost about a hundred pounds. Um, and, but also gained an eating disorder and IBS as a result of that. So the IBS came a little bit later, 
um, the eating disorder kind of resulted from not wanting to regain the weight, which is like this terrifying proposition after you've lost an, an incredible amount of weight. That's like the worst fear you could have. Yep. Um, and so that I would say kind of I was kind of plateaued around that time. And also around this time, I transitioned from going to culinary school into going into science. Um, I had always been like a major foodie, but realized very quickly in culinary school that it's a lot of work for a pretty small amount of money. Yeah. <laughs> and I uh, really found a knack for chemistry and I ended up transferring to a school actually after um, maybe this is an aside, but I had a very like powerful psychedelic experience that made me want to transition um, mm -hmm. into this new space and just try to understand science because I think it really just opened my mind to like the nature of reality and how complex and how like mysterious it is. And I just wanted to learn more. And so that kind of brought me into my undergraduate degree where I studied biochemistry and mathematics um, at Moravian College, which is a small school in the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania. Um, and during that time, I was dealing with IBS and ended up doing an elimination diet because I went to a doctor and they basically said, all we can essentially do is put you on immunotherapy. That's all really the only tool we have for something like this, because I basically was getting like blood and mucus in my stool every day. I couldn't eat anything without being in immense pain. Wow. And so I was like, I'm going to try to figure this out myself because I didn't always have this issue. It came on like pretty quickly. And, you know, maybe it's something that I'm doing. So I ended up doing an elimination diet and I found out that dairy was a major trigger for me. And when I removed it, literally all of my symptoms went away. Wow. Yes. So that was kind of my introduction into the idea of like what I'm putting into my body is affecting how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until a few years later after I started my time at Princeton um, I just basically didn't eat dairy for like five years straight, like no butter, nothing and no symptoms whatsoever, like complete remission. But during my time at Princeton, I started to get really interested in the microbiome after finding Joel Green's work and his book, The Immunity Code, mm -hmm. and really just opening my eyes to the importance of shaping a healthy gut microbe community in order to actually improve your inflammatory status, your ability to digest foods, um, your ability to just like age healthfully and so I ended up using his gut protocol, which basically it, it revolves around um, human milk oligosaccharides, which are a prebiotic found in human breast milk that is now available in supplement form, specifically is involved in feeding bifidobacteria in the gut, which is this really important community of microbes that support overall immune health and overall digestion of food as well, as well as like a red polyphenol powder and apple peel powder, which together kind of feed both bifidobacteria and acromantia, this other group of bacteria that are responsible for helping to maintain gut barrier integrity. And I was on that protocol for like six months straight. And at the end of that six months, I started reintroducing dairy and I had no issues with it. And then, you know, now to this day, this was a few years ago now. So I, I can still eat dairy and without having any problems. And so that was uh, like a real testament to me to just show like if you can really shape your microbiome um, and and care for it in a way that like will shape healthy microbe communities and not only will improve your digestive health but also just the way you're feeling and your neurotransmitters and just like your felt sense of well-being um and this also ties into the circadian story but maybe i'll just take a pause quickly because i've been ranting now for too long oh i love it i mean there's so i mean there's so much in this like do you think that because i know i've got so many people that are uh sirs and mold and these types of things um do you think that all of those things were compromising your gut and leading to a lot of this the issues that you had and um, that kind of doing this gut protocol and i know we're going to get into circadian and, and quantum a little bit more um, so i want to hear how that was supportive but just to kind of ask do you think that that was playing a role in in the gut issues i absolutely do i mean i I believe I had black mold in my childhood home, which I was in for 17 years of my life before I like moved out for college, essentially. So maybe about 18 years, actually. Um, I remember distinctly water damage type smells, which is like a telltale sign that there's mold somewhere. Oh, yeah. Um, we also had like carpet in our bathroom, which is like cringe. <laughs> oh, my God. We had one of those houses, too. Yeah. It was that, like my my grandfather, who I never met, he passed before I was born, but he built the house from scratch, like on the land and it's a really, it was a great plot of land. It was a very rural part of New Jersey, like amazing aspect of like having nature and having like a stream in my backyard and just forest, like basically super rural. But inside the house, I think there were just some like structural things that were suboptimal or maybe just damage happened over time that created this kind of accumulation. But 
I uh, not only was in mold for those first first 18 years of my life, but I also had black mold in another home that I moved into subsequently um, about halfway through my undergrad period of time. And I remember having migraines and brain fog every day for months and still not connecting the dots that it was the mold um, because I just hadn't learned about that at that time. But when I moved out, it literally felt like a weighted blanket was being moved off of me. And I was like, wow, like that is very powerful. So now I'm very sensitive to it. But yes, uh, I really view mold as like, well, on like the spiritual side, mold is like it accumulates in areas that you're not paying attention to enough. Um, and I think that's also like a, a fractal of, you know, maybe parts of ourselves that we're not paying attention to enough either. Um, yeah. But from like a chemical level, mold is secreting these mycotoxins that can directly poison mitochondria in a similar way that like statins are also mitochondrial poisons der derived from fungus. Black mold can also create toxins that directly poison our mitochondria. And anything that's damaging our mitochondria is going to be harmful to our metabolic health, to our mental health, to yeah. basically every organ system because they're required to actually make the energy and support just basal functions of cells and, re and regenerative capacity of cells. So I absolutely think there's a major link to be had there between anything that's harming our mitochondria, whether it's mold or something else, antibiotics or statin drugs, like whatever it is, if it's harming our mitochondria, it's going to externalize harm to virtually every system of our body at some level. Yeah. And and do you, I mean, did you have any siblings that lived in the home with you or your parents, did anybody that mm -hmm. was living with you, did they have like adverse health reactions to the mold? Or so I was, I was raised as an only child. I do have a half brother, but I didn't connect with him until my 20s. So I what I will say, though, is everybody in that house, including the dog, had obesity mm. or cancer. <laughs> wow. OK. That's yeah. So I, I yeah. think there's definitely something there. Um, and it also kind of makes sense that, you know, during that time where I was like in my late teen years, I was going out to friends' homes more. I was at the gym a lot. So like I was getting out of the house more and I was losing weight and I was feeling better. So I think that was a major player in my improvements in, in the way that I was feeling. Yeah, I still, you know, I haven't talked about it much, but I think that the autoimmune condition that my daughter has been struggling with was triggered by her school being at that school. And there was, I could smell like a mustiness in that building oh. and her health really started going downhill and we had like a week in the ICU last year in August. And after that week in the ICU, I was like, I'm not sending her back to that school. I'm done with it. Like I felt I already had a bad feeling about it, but I was just like, she can't go back because we had done like a gut microbiome test and it had come back that she was like high in mold and had mm. some mold toxicity. And I was like, there's, and I had had our house inspected and we, there's nothing wrong with this house, thank goodness. Um, and we have dehumidifiers and whole home air purifier. We have the whole nine. Um, but that was just one of those things. I was like, I think this is a kind of a trigger for this autoimmune. One of the trigger could be for this autoimmune thing that she's dealing with um, is mold. And so I think that, you know, it's one of those things like, I don't like people to get hung up on it and say, I can't heal because of this and it's impossible, it's irreversible. But I think you do have to get out of mold um, in order for your body to start healing. You know, that's why I never sent her back to that school. And I, you know, we had a pretty big settlement with the school system for her to go there. And I said, sorry, we're just going to have to let go of it. And she had, she stayed here for months and months until we found a better place for her, you know? Good. I mean, yeah, I think, uh, mold can be a real problem depending on how deep it goes into the house and like how oh, many wow. different parts of the house it's affecting it can be a very expensive task it sometimes is easier to actually just move it out it out yeah exactly yep. but i mean in the interim just like trying to you know work outside or just be outside more is going to make a huge difference because i mean if you think about it evolutionarily we're not really meant to live in these enclosed spaces that I are detached from light nature. is one yes. of the things that actually can live live with the mold right like if you're if you're exposed to mold outside there's high levels of mold outside but why you're not getting sick from it is there's the uv light and infrared to help offset the damage that the mold could possibly cause from outdoors you're not in an enclosed indoor space right yes exactly so the red and infrared light directly support mitochondrial function and and health and okay. at the same time the uv light is kind of keeping things in check with regards to microorganisms in the environment. It helps yeah. to just keep levels at like a, a healthy balance. And that makes so much sense because in the evolutionary environment, the sun is a given. It's always there. It's always there at a certain time of day. And obviously the intensity of the sun varies depending on the time of year, depending on where you live. But the sun is kind of regulating every aspect 
yes. of nature and of all organisms in nature, even the nocturnal ones. So to think that we're kind of above that and to just kind of kind of create this artificial indoor environment and we think that there's no ramifications for that, I think is very misguided. Agree. And then we don't think about the ramifications of the impact of uh, artificial blue light on yeah. the on the mitochondria as well as the impact of you know the foods that we're eating all these things that we're doing and the and the wi-fi non-native emf all of these things how these are impacting the mitochondria so it's like we're taking away this big mitochondrial support and then going indoors these enclosed environments and then pounding our bodies with things that are like wrecking the mitochondria and i don't think people everyone's so and i think food is important you know, absolutely. But I don't think people understand the implications of just simply like the light when it comes to mitochondrial health, right? Yes, totally. And that's actually the thing that really annoys me and like, frankly, pisses me off about the non-native EMF research is that they'll like study one frequency, of, let's say it's like 5G or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, they'll study it in isolation, they'll study it for a short period of time on cells or maybe in animals if you're lucky. And then they'll say, oh, it's safe. But they're not considering the fact that in the modern environment, we're exposed to a milieu of different exposures, which include 5G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and just all of the unnatural frequencies that we're exposed to. But we're also exposed to them like 24-7, 365, in combination with all of the garbage food, living indoors, the blue light, like it's all at the same time. And that's right. like, it's, it's and really hard for science to address the multifactorial nature of this problem. Agree. Yeah, well, you, we're, we've got you on the inside now, so. <laughs> <laughs> on the inside, outside. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so gosh, so, much, so many interesting things we could talk about, but I'd love to kind of hear the, the continuation of your story. So you got to this place where you're more in academia and you're on this healing track and, and what comes next and how do you get interested in the circadian and quantum aspect of health? Yes. So I'll continue the story. So at Princeton, just for background, um, I did my PhD at Princeton in the Rabinowitz lab, which is one of the top metabolism research labs in the world. Um, I did a lot of research there on nutrition and fasting and the effects of like high carb versus ketogenic diet on different tissues in the body. And also the like the impact of fasting on, the, on those uh, processes as well and how organs change their metabolic phenotype or how they're orchestrating metabolism in response to different inputs, essentially. So that was what most of my thesis work was on. Um, and so during this time, I was really revolutionizing my health. I was just kind of voraciously consuming information, all information that I could find about optimizing the microbiome. And I really thought at this time, like the microbiome is it, like it's the fundamental piece that we're missing. <laughs> and uh, and it's, as it turns out, so I mean, it is majorly beneficial and it's important to focus on. But then, so I graduate in December 2021. In January 2022, I start my business where I'm basically seeing clients one on one and helping them optimize their life. And at this time, I wasn't tapped into circadian biology at all. Um, so I was mostly focusing on optimizing gut health and the microbiome and and like as a knock on effect of that, also fat loss and metabolic health optimization. So that's like all of 2022. And, you know, it's going pretty well. I'm also teaching courses through my business at this time. And again, like no focus on light or anything like that. So then Spring of 2023 rolls around and I get a message from a client. It's like, hey, you should check out this podcast. And it was the Tetragrammaton episode with Rick Rubin, Andrew Huberman, and Uncle Jack, Jack Cruz. And I listened to this podcast and my literally my jaws on the floor the entire time. I'm like, how did I miss this piece? Like it, it literally was like something that was so obvious was just made clear to me. And it just revolutionized the way that I was thinking about everything. And so from that point on, so it's been about a year now that I've literally just been consuming as much information on this topic as I could, also completely changing my own personal life in the span of that, like a month's time when I first heard that podcast and also consuming other podcasts and content of his blogs and everything like that. So so for anybody who hasn't read uh, Jack Cruz's work, highly recommend checking out his podcast and He's like really the goat in this space in my mind. I'm so, so grateful for him. And I've had him on my podcast as well, actually. So super grateful for him. And so just in that month's time after I found that podcast, um, I started working outside more. I always kind of gravitated towards the sun and I'm mixed. So I always tanned really easily and barely ever burned. So um, I never was much of a sunscreen person. I never was much of a sunglasses person. 
though I'd have always worn like glasses and contacts since like fourth grade um, and not realizing like the knock on effects of that, which we can get into as well. But so during this basically last April, um, I just started living my life more so outdoors. We kind of changed all the lights in the house so that we could make them red at nighttime. We got blue blocking glasses. We really just started revolving our lives around the sun and developing a relationship with the sun for the first time, like a conscious one. In the past, it was always kind of like, yeah, I unconsciously like being outside in nature. But now it's it's at the point where it's like I I can feel the difference so profoundly in my own body when I'm not spending time outdoors. And I know why now. So it's like I can't unsee these effects. And so I also have changed my entire practice to revolve at a fundamental level around circadian biology and optimizing sun exposure and the light environment. And then everything else builds on that. And like a great testament to this actually is the the impact of UV light on the microbiome. So we yes. there's actually uh, really cool studies that came out that show UVB light on the skin modulates the microbiome via the skin gut axis and actually helps to increase gut microbial diversity. So I loved how that learning that really brought it full circle for me is like, wow, yeah, like light is really fundamental. It's even changing the way microbes are interacting in our bodies and our, our gut microbiome composition independent of food, which yes. food has just been like diet and exercise, diet and exercise of oh, such a focus in our culture. And yet the results aren't actually very good. People are getting sicker. And it's because this we're kind of really missing the bigger picture here. Agree. Yeah. I mean, when you kind of understand the implications of light on the microbiome, it's hard to go back to the kind of like the biochemical way of looking at the, the microbiome and the body. It's like, yeah, that's really interesting. But here's this other thing that we have. And like you said, I think most humans have this innate feeling that they should be outside. They should be connected to the earth. They should be touching, you know, natural bodies of water and things like that. It feels good, but they don't really quite understand. And when you can understand these things, like just something as simple as like how UV light touching the skin or near infrared and red light, how these things have the ability to impact the microbiome positively. It's like, oh, well, duh, you know, of, of course I want to be outside. Of course I want to be connected um, to the earth in that way. But it just sounds super woo woo until we have somebody like you who's got uh, scientific qualifications and study and, and, and this type of thing. People want to hear it from somebody like you. So again, that's why I'm excited that you're really diving into this work now because you've done all of the research and you've done all of the study on metabolism and health and you've come back to circadian biology really, right? Yes, absolutely. And I would say one of the, like the most important perspectives that I've gained just from being in academia is just uh, our inability within academia to ask these questions as it relates to light in the right way. So I even like pitched a project on like UV light and like sun exposure to some colleagues and like uh, advisors at Penn when I, I was doing my postdoc at Penn last year. And you know, the feedback I got was like, oh, this is really interesting. We need to figure out how to like get UV light and red light into like a mouse cage and do the experiment. I'm like, the sun is outside right, right now. <laughs> right. But, but the, the labs don't want to study the sun directly because if you like literally have a lab outside, there's a lot of other variables, I yeah. guess, you know, in the air and like the exposure to different microbes and things like that. So my dream is really to build a lab that has like quartz glass sunroof so we can get the full spectrum of light coming down into the actual mouse facility, for example. And then we can directly study the effects of like, you know, sunlight, full spectrum sunlight on rodent physiology just as a, as a beginner. But obviously we would love to study humans because rodents are nocturnal. So that's right. not really a good match. Right. Um, and so we want to know, you know, in diurnal human beings, what are these different effects? And there's, there's also a lot of research already done on this topic that's kind of just been ignored. Like you can even look back and see these papers spanning back over 50 years, 60, 70 years. And like this information is there. It's just not being broadcasted because it actually goes against the centralized paradigm narrative, the status quo that like the sun is toxic and bad and you need to stay out of it. It's going to give you cancer, which is like the exact opposite of what's actually happening. Right. Yeah, I, I no, I mean, cancer is exploding. And I feel like it's just kind of the the end stage of the body trying to 
heal trying to protect right first we get inflammation this low-lying inflammation and then it builds and builds and i think the body is constantly sending you signals and clues that something is brewing and something is wrong and by the time somebody actually gets cancer it, i think it's kind of this like in stage mitochondrial uh dysfunction and it's like wow something has really gone awry and all the people that i have known that have gotten cancer are not people who are going outdoors, who are grounding, who are circadian aligned, who are doing these things is very opposite of that, in fact. And so it's like, I think we really need to question that narrative more and more. And there's obviously, um, we talk about sun, safe sun exposure. I know that you educate on this as well. So it's not like we're sitting out here saying, oh, you need to just like go lay in the sun for six hours, because I think that could be detrimental to people. But there's a way to do this so that it is beneficial for your body, right? Yes, absolutely. And so, I mean, I think, especially with regards to the melanoma story and like the propaganda around that, if we just like ask basic questions and like make basic observations about, about melanoma, the story starts to like fall apart. So it's like, what's one of the biggest risk factors for melanoma? It's vitamin D deficiency. Where do we get most of our vitamin D? From the sun. Like, despite, you know, what the authorities may say, like, we didn't have vitamin D supplements evolutionarily speaking no. we would get some through the diet and like fatty fish but mostly like that would be in the winter time when you only have access to those types of foods because the ground's frozen depending on where like your ancestors were so vitamin d deficiency associated with melanoma which is basically saying like the way i think about vitamin d is as a biomarker for sun exposure it's not like this bio like this marker that we just need to supplement our way right. into it's optimization for light it's a trap for that energy in the body it, yeah it's it's definitely a biomarker yes. and in like a a magnifying glass on how much sun exposure are you getting because I know Harvard came out with like some which is all crap like uh just do the vitamin d supplements it's the same thing as sunlight like there was this whole campaign of that and I'm like oh my god that is the most misguided <laughs> thing I've ever seen in my life I can't believe people are actually like going for this I know. well that's the, the scary thing is that like these quote unquote, authority figures can say something and it will just be taken at face value without any sort of critical thought from the, the vast majority of the population. Right. And like when we unpack that story, like it really couldn't be further from the truth. Just at like a basic level, we we know like in the literature, it's really clear that when UVB light hits your skin, not only pre-vitamin D3 is made, but also like a dozen other vitamin D like molecules that you need UV light exposure. You're not going to get that from a supplement. Right. And then that doesn't even that's not even accounting for the whole Palm C or the pro opio melanocortin story, which is also stimulated by UV light exposure in the skin and the eyes. And then when you're getting that exposure, that Palm C molecule is cleaved into 10 different distinct hormones that, that affect everything from your ability to lose weight, your ability for muscle to burn fat effectively, your ability for your mitochondria to function, as well as all of the endorphin molecules that make you feel good and have less anxiety and have better focus. All of these things are produced in response to palm C production, and you're only getting that from UVB light exposure, specifically UVB light, which is the one that's like the most demonized out of all of it. Right. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a crazy story, and you know I don't know how you feel because I'm somebody that that struggle. I feel like I'm, our stories are very similar with the weight issues. Um, I struggle with my weight my entire life, and I always felt like I was like addicted to food and like had to stay away from certain foods. And now with the circadian lifestyle and these things, and I've been doing this for the last few years. I no longer have that crazy like addictive side to me when it comes to food. Like if I want to have something that was a quote unquote forbidden food, um, like a piece of birthday cake or a cookie, and I don't need to have 20 of them and I don't need to eat it for weeks on end. And I really think it's the, the melanocorn pathway and Palm C, that's the story that is allowing this. And when I tell this to people, they think I'm just being some woo woo crazy chick, but like there's literal science behind like what you just said to support those uh, neuropeptides and neurohormones that are gonna cause you to have a regulated appetite and have neurotransmitter support so you're not seeking these things out, have good levels of dopamine and serotonin so you're not constantly looking for a food to boost these things in your brain. And I think that was like, a big problem for me. I don't know. You, it sounds like you've kind of <laughs> feel the same way about those things. Absolutely. I mean, so alpha MSH, which is one of the cleavage products of Palm C is the most highly reg like the, the most highly correlated gene product with obesity. Yes. So that's already well known, like in academia, they've known that for a while. And the major stimulus for alpha MSH production in the brain and in the skin 
the lights it's it's uv light yep. and and not only that but like you just alluded to the beta alpha and gamma endorphins that helps to increase your baseline dopamine levels so you don't even feel compelled to reach for these quick hits of dopamine that people get from you know social media addictions drug addictions uh food addictions whatever it is like this any any sort of like compulsive feeling like you feel like you need something that's literally your body craving a, a dopamine hit and it's yeah. because your baseline dopamine levels are so low because you're living this indoor artificially lit lifestyle that you're not getting your endogenous drug production we're supposed to be drug factories our bodies make right. them right. we're meant to be addicted to the sun that's why you know we, we wouldn't have been shaped by evolution to make endorphins in response to uv light exposure if it wasn't good for us it's literally nature telling us this is what we need to thrive yep agree and I would love to hear your take on just kind of connecting all these pieces together in your personal experience with mold. You know, I saw a post on social media the other day of somebody saying like, I'm leptin resistant because of mold. I can't lose weight because of mold. And so obviously, you know, you and I both agree if someone's living in mold, they need to get out of the mold. Um, but how do, do you think that um, possibly the circadian and quantum pieces could support this person are they screwed is that pathway completely unavailable because of mold or how can we how can we kind of work with that person and what would you say to a post like that yeah i mean i i try to think about most things in a dose response and like mold is no different so if you're exposed to it 24 hours a day seven days a week because you're not ever leaving your house and you're just kind of inundated in it and you, you become like a victim to it, thinking there's nothing you can do. Well, any time that you can just remove yourself from that, from that environment is going to help to reduce the dose that you're getting. And ultimately, I think the fundamental problem with the mold exposure is the you know direct effects on mitochondria, which then has a bunch of knock-on effects to things like your microbiome composition and fungal infections and parasite infections and brain fog and just overall low energy levels, which might be driving you to consume more carbohydrates. And just it's dysregulating the way that you operate in your life because you're kind of operating from this deficit at all times. Yes. And your body is just desperate to like make the energy that it needs in order to actually just meet basic, you know, metabolic functions and regenerative functions. Um, and we really need to get into red and infrared light to support that because that red and infrared light from the sun, ideally, um, is actually able to penetrate into the body where it directly stimulates and supports mitochondria. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're living an indoor lifestyle, LED and fluorescent lighting and all of our devices are completely devoid of red and infrared light because they're energy efficient, quote unquote, which basically means there's no red and infrared light because infrared light is heat. Right. And heat is seen as this like, you know, waste, it's inefficiency, but really it's infrared light. And that infrared light is crucial for the regulation of our biology and our mitochondrial function. So something as simple as, you know, taking your meals outside. There was actually a really cool paper recently that showed, uh, you know, after a carbohydrate containing meal, your blood sugar spike is lower if you eat it in front of a red and infrared light. So the easiest thing to do for that is just eat outside. Even if it's a cloudy day, you're getting a lot of red and infrared light because it's able to very effectively penetrate through the clouds. It can even penetrate through your clothing. So you don't even necessarily need to expose all of your skin to like directly to the light. So the red and infrared light part of the puzzle is crucial in this context because we just want to do anything we can to support our mitochondrial function at any level possible. And that's kind of at the fundamental base level. Once you optimize that and then ideally also add in the um, UV light as well, because then you get all the benefits of the Palm C cascade and its effects on just hope helping you feel overall better, then you can actually think better and make better decisions in all areas of your life because you're not operating from this dulled out, like just kind of zombified mode that you're going to be in if you're under artificial lights all day because we didn't talk about this yet, but also blue light yep. is enriched within LED and fluorescent in our devices. And that blue light actually has the opposite effect on mitochondria as red light. So blue light actually impairs mitochondrial function. It doesn't necessarily penetrate into the body, but it affects the skin, the eyes, and the proximal brain regions, which include the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is that master clock that controls the circadian biology of every cell in the body. So if you're impairing mitochondria in those tissues, you're going to have knock-on effects to every system in your body because that master clock is no longer orchestrating the regulation of circadian, you know, rhythmicity of gene expression, of regeneration, of 
of, of so many different processes that's that it's orchestrating, it's not going to be able to do that effectively. And that's going to create kind of this like a spitballing effect onto all of your organ systems and make everything worse. So the more we can leverage our light and optimizing our light environments and our sun exposure, it's going to make a huge difference when it comes to healing mold and detoxing mold and just supporting our body's ability to naturally regenerate itself. Thank you so much for listening to the Evolving Wellness Podcast. If you are over on YouTube, make sure to give us a like, leave us a comment, especially if you are enjoying today's show. If you're on Spotify or Apple, go ahead and leave the show up to a five-star review. Share it with a friend or a family member, especially if you're enjoying it and finding benefit from the show. Dr. Alexis's information is all in the show notes as well. And I would love if we could all support her, follow her work, and continue to watch as she grows in this community of explaining and understanding circadian biology. So again, make sure to check her out. That is all down in the show notes and let's jump back into the show. Yeah, it's, you know, the amount of people, and I'm sure as a practitioner, you're getting this as well, like the amount of people that are coming in with uh, mold and SIRS and all these different diagnoses, I'm like, they're like, how would I treat uh, myself differently than your average client? And I'm like, you wouldn't. Like for everyone, I'm going to tell you pretty much a lot of the same things. You need to spend, you need to maximize that time in morning sunlight and maximize your time in UVA, in that morning UVA because of the leptin melanocortin pathway, because of Palm C, because of all we need this to be happening in you and you, ha- you need to strengthen um, the ability of your body to, again, cleave these, these specific things that are going to support your appetite, that are gonna support your body's ability to heal and repair. And it's not like I need you to go buy a bunch of fancy gadgets or do anything crazy. I just really want you out there in that time. And I think um, I'll get people that are like, oh, I'm doing this, your program, and it's not working. And the first thing that I'm not going to ask them about food will get there because it's important. The first thing I'm going to ask them is how much time are you spending outside in the morning? Oh, I two minutes. I'm like... (laughs) sorry to tell you that's not going to be enough and I'm not going to tell you to quit your job and I'm not going to tell you to move um, right off the bat and I I don't like to tell that to people in general Uh, but it's two minutes is not going to do it right (laughs) absolutely and and also like the amount of time you need is gonna I I mean I say I would say we all have like a fundamental need but if you're really sick you're gonna have to go harder on these things because your body is kind of at a critical point where like you could you know face a life-threatening condition or you could it's basically a turning point or you could start to remediate the problems and so for somebody who's coming to me really sick we're gonna have to be more strict and like really dial this stuff in more than somebody who's just trying to optimize a baseline just because you know the 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 like the stakes are higher in the one case so it's going to depend a little bit on that but I also like to really use um like vitamin d as a biomarker for sun exposure so like the the mainstream medical model will say you know anything more than like around 30 nanograms per mil is fine but this is totally suboptimal between 60 and 80 nanograms per mil is what you would achieve if you're living like a, a more outdoor lifestyle and that's what's actually going to help to fully suppress parathyroid hormone production which is basically parathyroid hormone turns on whenever vitamin D is insufficient because it helps to regulate calcium and phosphate balance in the bloodstream. Um, So in order to get full suppression of parathyroid hormone, we need levels at least over 40 nanograms per mil of vitamin D. And so if you use vitamin D as a biomarker, then you can kind of use something like a D-Minder app. You get your baseline vitamin D level from, you know, your doctor or order your own labs, throw in your labs or something like that find your baseline level, then you can plug it into that app. You can say, you know, this is my goal. This is where I'm currently at. And it will tell you how much sun you need to get each day or, you know, as many days as you can, depending on the weather. And that's going to help you to dial in like the total amount of time that you're going to need, at least during like middle of the day sun. For morning sun, I think, you know, depending on somebody's morning routine, a lot of people will have time. They just need to shift their sleep schedule a bit to make the time earlier in the day to just spend that time outside, eat their breakfast outside, just like do whatever they were going to do inside, just do it outside. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it just is. A, it's a lot of shifting. And I know that you coach this in your programs and with your clients because I get I know you you never knew so many people lived in like Norway, Iceland and Sweden until you start posting on social media. <laughs> so how, how do you kind of help people that are in those more extreme climates like the northern latitudes? Do you have protocols to help support those people? Because I know they're going to be in the comments. <laughs> 
Yeah, totally. So, I mean, if they're there and their ancestors were also kind of from there, they're kind of well equipped to um, be in that environment. But what it takes is to try to live more ancestrally in that way because their biology is literally evolved to be in like decent quality sun for part of the year and pretty yeah. poor quality sun the other part of the year. And but what that means is that the, the time where there's not good quality sun, they're meant to get cold because cold has a lot of reciprocal effects on biology that light does. So yeah. you get a lot of the benefits internally from sun that you do from cold. So if you can leverage cold exposure, it doesn't have to mean that you have to sit outside in the cold all day, but at least getting some cold exposure each day is going to be majorly beneficial when it comes to mitochondrial health and your metabolism, metabolic function and your glucose regulation, which has, of course, knock on effects to your the way your brain's functioning, whether fungal organisms can grow, um, things like this. So leveraging cold when you can't get light is going to be huge. Um, there are also like, obviously it's not ideal, but you can somewhat biohack this through using something like a red and infrared light panel and like a spurty light inside, which can yeah. give you some UV light and red and infrared light inside. So I also use those during the winter. I also mm -hmm. tried to get cold as well. Um, but if you're, you know, maybe you're sick and you're really trying to get better, but you can't afford to move somewhere equatorial or stay there for a few weeks, then you could leverage these light devices indoors to get a decent amount of the benefits of that. Yeah. And I, I kind of, I don't know about you, but I kind of question the the narrative of like, everyone needs to move to the equator. Everybody needs to move to this environment because I'm at like an H2 haplotype and my, I, my DNA is like, I need to be cold. Like it, it evolved uh, because my ancestors stayed alive in the cold, not because I was running from tigers. And like, so my mitochondria is actually a little bit different than like an equatorial haplotype. And your mitochondria, when exposed to cold, I just did a lesson on this for my leptin practitioner course, they make uh, not only infrared inside the mitochondria, but also UVC light, which we can't yes. even really get when we go outside anymore. So it's like, we have a way and, and it, that supports neuromelanin, it supports um, melanin in, in the nervous system. And it's like, wait a second, your body has the ability to kind of have a, a sun inside of itself. So yeah, I question that narrative of everyone needs to to move south. Like, I think there's a lot of healing properties of dark and cold for people as well. Absolutely. I totally agree. I mean, I, I the only thing that I would say is if somebody has got like a, you know, chronic neurodegenerative disease or cancer or something yes. that's like literally like about to end their life, they'll probably get more benefit from being in more sun versus Agreed. cold only because cold is also very stressful on the body. And Great. if they're not cold adapted whatsoever, that could be a lot to ask of them. And so yeah. typically it's easier to t just tell them, you know, to lay out in the sun. And uh, ideally it would be like on a beach somewhere because then you get like a super conduction of, of like the earthing and grounding effect from the salt water and the sand and the sun all at once. So that would be ideal. Um, and uh, imagine like if you have like a healing retreat center, literally on a beach, people just come and like lay on the beach, go yeah. in the water and that's yeah. their healing. And it's, yep. it's so therapeutic. And, uh, so yeah, and but it I think for... deuterium too, like that yes. that really high UV index is needed for deuterium depletion, and I think that is people that are with have those diseases, they typically have very high levels of deuterium as well, and so that yeah, I think you're right about that for sure. Yeah, I mean the deuterium story is really interesting because it's both like associated with mitochondrial dysfunction and also causal, so I think it's really like an interesting dynamic going on there that I really want. I would love the research to pick up even more in that area. I hope people are doing that. It's definitely yeah. not a mainstream topic, but I think um, like we know deuterium can accumulate if your mitochondria are not right. being supported. Right. So like if you're living an indoor lifestyle and you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, especially during the winter time when you're not getting sun, like ideally, you know, we should be kind of timing our food or like orchestrating our diet to match the sun environment because, you know, naturally we would only be able to get access to certain foods at certain times of year. So that eating more of like a higher fat, higher protein diet in the winter, if you're where somewhere that the, the ground freezes and it gets cold, you're going to be supporting your mitochondria because those foods are naturally depleted in deuterium. So during that time where you're not getting good quality sun and that UV light, then you're just going to naturally keep your deuterium levels lower through not consuming as much through the diet versus in the months where you're getting better quality sun you can tolerate more of those carbohydrate containing foods that are, are enriched in deuterium because you're going to be able to deplete it more effectively. Exactly. Yeah. There's, I mean, all of it, it all is still goes back to the story about light and, and how it impacts our health. 
Yes, absolutely. So that's why I have a protocol that's literally called the foundational protocol, and it's all the circadian stuff in the light environment because it is so foundational to building health. Like you, you really need to nail this foundation if you want to build health because nothing else is just rooted at such like a basic level of the way our physiology is regulated and the way that it's working. If we're not nailing that, but we've got like a perfect diet and, and movement practice, but we're doing it indoors and we're not eating like a seasonally appropriate diet, we're going to run into issues down the line. Yeah. And I saw you, I don't know if, if it was your stories or a post that you did recently where you were talking about how you have been consistently working out outdoors and you haven't really been getting sore, but you went to a gym recently and then- yes. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that. I thought that was really interesting. I'm literally still recovering from that workout. <laughs> it's insane. So I went to the gym on Saturday um, and I didn't lift any crazy weights. Like I lift these similar weights all the time at home, but I've been doing it either in my garage gym without overhead lighting or out in my yard. I'll just like roll the weights out. We have like a barbell set and dumbbell set. So I'll do that. But this time we had our gym account frozen. So I, I went because um, it had just unfrozen and I did kind of my full routine. And during the workout, I felt like my muscles were working so hard, like they were working unnecessarily hard to do these movements. That's what I felt like. Mm. And then I literally since then, it's been like four days now. and I'm still my muscles are still sore from that workout. And it was just a huge testament to me also because I had recently been either doing the workouts outside or doing them inside in front of my red and infrared light panel while I'm doing the lifts. And I had zero soreness afterwards. And now this one workout in the gym under these like bright LED lights, I'm really feeling it. And it was just a huge testament to the power of red and infrared light to support your mitochondria and their ability to produce energy that is required for you to obviously contract your muscles and just to support overall muscle metabolism and all the metabolic functions of your tissues. Um, so if you're able to leverage red and infrared light during a workout, you're going to work out more efficiently. You're going to be able to move more load. You're going to be able to do more work. You're going to get better results ultimately. Um, and versus like working out under LED or fluorescent lights, you're going to be working harder for less results. And it's kind of akin to stepping on the gas and the brakes at the same time, because you're on one hand stepping on the gas, you're demanding energy production from your muscles to do this activity. On the other hand, there's no red and infrared light to actually support that activity. And on the converse, there's actually blue light that's impairing mitochondrial function. So you're, it's kind of like very um, like divergent signals being sent to your body. Yep, absolutely. And my friend, um, Dr. Sarah Pugh, she's staying with me right now. Whenever she goes to the gym, she actually, if she goes to the gym, she actually brings her little yes. battery operated uh, panel with her and just kind of like brings it around the gym. <laughs> Yes, I literally just made a post before we hopped on this call and I it was about this topic and I said like either, you know, work out outside in front of a red and infrared light panel or get like a portable one and bring it with you and just like shine it on your muscles between sets so that you're getting some of that stimulus. Yeah, and she flew here from the UK. It was like a really long flight and she didn't have like a whole ton of jet lag or other issues because she fasted all the way here and then the, you know, until the next day when she woke up, got here on like a Tuesday afternoon and didn't eat until Wednesday morning. So that fasting, I think, was really helpful. But she also had her little battery operated um, panel that she kept on putting on her thyroid and just like kind of shining on herself. Like she said, every hour or so during the flight, she'd get it out and just do some red light therapy. And her jet lag was like no issue at all. So it's yeah, so amazing. Pretty fast. It's so simple. Yeah, exactly. That's again, I think people want, and this is why I love this conversation because you have done the work on metabolism and you have done, I mean, ex you have a PhD for heaven's sake <laughs> on this stuff. And it's like, you've done it, you know, and you, I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you see the power and the impact of um, circadian biology and quantum biology on human physiology and metabolism. And I think it's much more powerful than the the current scientific model. I don't know if I'm, again, putting words in your mouth, but. <laughs> I know, I mean, that's that's definitely how I feel. And I, I see a lot of the shortcomings in the way that science is conducted just by the very nature of like having a reductionist mindset. We're missing a lot of the picture. Um, and on one hand, like that's the tool that's used in order to try to isolate variables and like determine what that single variable is doing within a system. But on the other hand, in nature and in like real life, everything is working in symphony. It's not anything in isolation. So 
this is especially problematic within like translational research where it's like we're making these reductionist claims and like doing these reductionist experiments and then we're trying to apply them in the medical context where you know we have very complex diseases in complex bodies where all the organs are talking to each other in unique ways and everything is interconnected but we're trying to isolate you know this is what's causing this and then if we drug this then we're going to get this outcome but that's just not how things work in the real world and I think it's just so painfully obvious that that's the case because look at our health outcomes. They're worse than ever. We're spending more money than ever than any other country on on our health care. And we have the worst health outcomes. Our life expectancy is actually decreasing in this country. So we're we're clearly doing something wrong. And I think people are starting to open up to this notion since COVID. I think COVID was yep. ugh, just a whole shit show, but it was ultimately a blessing because it really yeah. exposed a lot of the shortcomings and like the the house of cards that is like the cdc and the centralized power structures and that they really just at the end of the day don't know what they're talking about about most things and i think there's a lot of perverse incentives involved in the recommendations yeah. that they are making oh yeah sarah uh dr pew and i we just uh, she had never seen dope sick before i don't know if you've seen oh, yeah yeah we just re we wish watched it i watched it when it first came out in 2021 but she had been wanting to see it and i was like oh yeah I i'll totally rewatch this with you um which by the way we watched starting at like eight o'clock at night and we were watching tv with blue blockers on covered up skin all the good stuff still had my energy's been effed like my sleep was not good my energy i'm like even with the blue because i never do this but i was like yeah, now I know why I do what I do and I talk about what I talk about, even with, you know, like why are so many people having trash sleep and feel like crap? Because they're doing this every night. I can't even imagine. But <laughs> tangent, you know, just like going back to like how corrupt the systems are and people have no idea that a lot of these things that we're being told are safe are not really actually based on anything in reality, that there are pay structures that we don't know about going on. And it's just like, you have to question uh, these things. And yeah, 2020 kind of just ripped the mask off, so to speak. But there's yes. there's still a lot of, um, there's still a lot of people who are kind of wanting to turn a blind eye to this. And I think it's to their detriment. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's only gonna be able to sustain for so much longer. I think uh, it's ultimately a, a failing system and structure and, I think ultimately truth prevails in general. It just takes some time and it takes a lot of suffering, unfortunately, because, I mean, suffering is just the way that life uses to wake us up. And the amount of suffering we need varies depending on the person, depending on like their biases and how dogmatic they are and how closed off they are, which is actually fun fact also related to your light environment, because if you're not getting sun, you're going to have this very rigid, like poor dopamine depleted system that's not able to think critically and think about these types of things in a way that's like fruitful and productive. And so, I mean, it just totally makes sense when you think about the light story that there's so much dogma within science and medicine because all of these people are literally poisoning themselves. And I actually laugh because um, even when I was doing my mouse work at Princeton and at Penn, um, you know, if you want to go into the mouse rooms at night, you can, but you can only turn on a red light because they know that the red light is going to be way less disruptive to the animals than if you put on the bright white lights like are on during the day. And yet nice. these same researchers that are going to check on their mice at night with the red light then walk back to their lab and get irradiated with fluorescent and LED lights, not thinking twice about it. <laughs> wow. wow. That's crazy. Yeah, it's so funny. Like, I think people are, when you explain this to them, they start to connect the dots. Like I had a conversation with one of my group members in, in my private group the other day, and she's like, we're talking about blood tests. And we're talking, she's like, well, you know, if, if I'm fasting for this blood test, doesn't that make my cortisol a little bit higher? And I'm like, yeah, and you're under uh, artificial blue light. It's, you know, I think we have to question sometimes these labs and not hang our hat on that. Like they can be um, helpful clues, but it's again, kind of going back to academia and how they conduct research and science. Like when you're actually getting a blood draw, you're not sitting outside grounded. And if you were sitting outside grounded, I think you would probably have a completely different result on your labs because of the zeta potential of the blood when you're grounded because of the impact of the infrared light and UV light on the body. And it's like, yeah, like we just are, I think, just getting health completely upside down. Totally. I mean, on one hand, uh, Jack Cruz also talks about the idea that there's no light controls in any of our research right. for natural light. 
But on the other hand, if you think about it, like actually the light exposures that we're getting in these research studies are recapitulating normal life for the vast majority of people. And no wonder everybody's so sick because we're literally like doing this day in and day out. It's not like just a one off exposure. It's like, no, people are, you know, under this artificial light all day, even at nighttime. They're not getting outside. They're not grounding. They're just completely disconnected from nature. And that's showing in, in the blood labs. And that's also I, I mean, I have a love-hate relationship with labs like on one hand yeah. it's interesting to see the data sometimes but it's sometimes hard to actually s understand what's going on from that data yeah and then I also think about you know our senses evolved to perceive a specific resolution of reality and now we're kind of meddling with you know higher resolution like zooming in on our bodies in a way that we did not evolve to actually understand and yeah. probably for a reason probably because nature didn't want us meddling with this stuff and now we're kind of overriding that with our frontal prefrontal cortex and in, in, in every aspect of our life. But in, in the context of medicine, we're looking at things that are very complex and interconnected. And we don't really even understand. We're barely beginning to understand the complexities of these. We probably never will. Yeah. Primarily because our senses are evolved to perceive a specific level of reality and not really beyond that. And when we try to go beyond that, we start to you know, make false assumptions and, and come to false conclusions because we don't really know what we're looking at. Right. And, and you know, the impact of the water network of the body, I think that's completely ignored. And uh, my partner, Carrie Bennett, we have our podcast, Quantum Conversation. She's been talking about this quite a bit in her community it is just like, Mm, how hydrated are the receptor sites for thyroid? How is it a dehydrated receptor site? Like there's just so much that we don't understand about the water network and this coherence and the ability of our bodies to kind of just change based on hydration status and, and cellular water. Um, and we know so much about how blue light and Wi-Fi and these things can dehydrate us on that cellular level. And it's like, that's not even, uh, not even a conversation, even sometimes in the circadian world, it's like, yeah, that this is a whole other realm that needs to be looked at as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, Water is really, really interesting. And actually, fun, funny you brought up about thyroid and water because uh, there was a postdoc in my lab when I was at Princeton who started studying thyroid hormone. And he was, we were having a conversation. He was telling me, like, I have this suspicion that thyroid hormone actually might not be acting directly on metabolism to regulate it. But instead, it's changing where water goes within cells, uh -huh. which... Super interesting, right? I've been actually meaning to follow up with him to see okay, if he like. Please do, and please yeah. like <laughs> follow up with me. Like that's yeah, that's fascinating, right? Because I think we're we're starting to understand how profound water and water networks are within the body, how they're regulating everything. Yep. Essentially, mm -hmm. um, there was actually uh, Cliff Brangwen. Uh, he's at, at Princeton. He was the one who identified phase separation like he he won a big prize for i don't remember the prize it wasn't the nobel prize but it was another big prize but phase separation is essentially you get like these droplets that form within cells and within these yes. droplets you can get like these different enzymes that are kind of uh like corresponding to each other let's say in glycolysis you have all the enzymes in the glycolysis maybe you can have all of those enzymes within a, a phase like a phase separation dro droplet and then when glucose enters the cell if it interacts with that droplet, it's like, boom, it just goes through all the enzymes at once because everything is kind of there. And so I think that's a, a really important representation of just like the importance of hydration and the way that water is interacting because those droplets can only form in certain hydration states. Yes. Um, and so this is acting at like a very, very fundamental level within cells and within tissues and the body. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this research evolves and how much it's going to potentially shift the way that we view ourselves and the way oh, that yeah. we like view health. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've had uh, conversations with some people who I consider to be like genius level, like polymath. And they've really expressed to me that we talk so much about ATP, but really the energy currency of the body looking at cytochrome four and the ability of the, you know, the mitochondria to make that deuterium depleted water being um, as important as ATP as far as energy currency in the body goes. I I love that. I love that. And actually, so the ATP story never 
really fully Hands resonated out. with me because yeah. like there's this nebulous idea of free energy in biology and in chemistry and it's like what does that actually mean it's like right. well uh, at some level it's like when you talk about enzymes and kinetics it's like lowering the activation energy enough in order for that enzyme to actually allow that substrate to be catalyzed into the the product but how like free energy is facilitating this process i think it probably has to do with the way that water is shaping around uh, around receptor sites and yes. that's actually changing whether a substrate can bind <laughs> yes Exactly. So if you're like, what the hell did she just say? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the ability of your mitochondria to make water and, you know, support this water network of your body. I think that's really where a lot of a lot of research needs to go. Um, yeah, totally. Totally. And also just like really separating water that you're drinking and not yes. thinking about that as hydration because the water that our cells make is far more important mm -hmm. than the water that we're drinking the water we're drinking is also important it's going to influence things but mm -hmm. the water that we're making is really at a core level that like is going to dictate how hydrated we are at a cellular level yep. and if we think about cellular hydration that's what's really correlated with like aging and disease because yes. you can see you know you're born like almost 90 percent water yeah, and yeah. if you live yeah. to like 90 years old you're maybe in your like 50, 50 something percent, percent. Yeah. exactly yeah. so we're losing water and as we lose water we're losing like efficiency within cells yeah um, that's preventing these you know enzymes from acting and from like your metabolism from occurring appropriately so i think a focus on cellular hydration is absolutely crucial when we're thinking about optimizing our health yeah, absolutely. That's in my uh, leptin practitioner course. I have like an entire week just devoted to cellular hydration, and because I think it's crucial. Like in in my even in my twenty one day course, like we I have to have them understanding it's about coaching the mitochondria to make water. Not and yes, what you drink is important, and we'll go over that and I can give you some pointers there. But like you could be pouring in this high quality, amazing water, structured water, hydrogen water, whatever and it not be doing any good if you are trapped indoors under artificial blue light, disconnected from the earth, um, surrounded by non-native EMF all the time. Like it's just, it's only gonna do so much for you, if anything at all. Exactly, I mean, maybe one exception to this where the research is kind of pretty cool is like using drinking deuterium depleted water oh, to yes. influence deuterium levels yep. within cells. So like for somebody who's really sick, like there's been pretty cool research on cancer and yep. deuterium depleted oh, water yeah. and like improving outcomes. Yeah. So I think that could be one form of water that you're drinking that can have a, an impact if you're really sick. Obviously, it's kind of cost prohibitive for the most yeah. people to use. But uh, I think there is probably something to be said about that being beneficial in specific like disease contexts. Yeah, I agree. I totally yeah. agree. Well, what's next for you? What are you what are you working on? What are you excited about? Good question. I mean, I'm always learning. Actually, so I just finished taking a course that might might seem out of left field, but it was an astro herbalism course that was connecting astrology with herbalism. But basically, like how I mean, we all recognize that the sun mm -hmm. has this Im immense force on our planet, and also the moon, immense force on the waters of the planet. So, in this same vein of thinking, the the idea of like the alchemists back in the day was that each planet has a specific energy that it's bringing to the planet and that can manifest in different ways in plants but also in humans and if you think about the planets you can kind of think about them as organs of the solar system in the same way that we have organs within our body um so the course i just took was absolutely fascinating it was basically just allowing you to get more specificity when working with people and understanding like core imbalances that they have and like all of this stuff that we just discussed is like first and foremost, but then just just adding some layers of like nuance and specificity on top of that to like see the individuality of the person in front of you and be able to help them in specific ways to address any sort of core inherent imbalances that may they may have been dealt. Um, and through like the modern scientific lens, we could say that could be through um, like like mitochondrial heteroplasmy so like in the egg you're kind of given all of your initial mitochondria from your mom depending on how your mom and your grandma and, and their mother lived their lives you're going to be dealt yeah. different hands of mitochondria and those mitochondria will be partitioned into different organs as you're a developing fetus and depending on which organs get like the worst hand let's say of mitochondria you might develop a chronic disease in that organ for example so at the on the level of modern science we could say you know based on um, mitochondrial mitochondrial mutation rates or heteroplasmy that can kind of dictate 
organ imbalances and like core imbalances within the body. So this is kind of looking at it from another lens, like as literally like different imbalances of like planetary energies within your organ systems. And they kind of, I think they, in, in my mind, they've been fusing really nicely and I've just been so excited about that. So I'm going to be incorporating that into my practice a little bit. Um, but overall, I'm just like, just uh, so thirsty for knowledge. I really want to start like a, a private scientific foundation, like a research institute mm -hmm. where we're crowdfunding and philanthropically funding projects. And I want to build like a sun research lab. Like that would be my dream. Um, so I'm working on that. But in the meantime, I'm just really trying to kind of build a network, you know, get 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 things kind of moving, get people kind of interested in these topics and just thinking in this way so that, that we have enough, you know, kind of general interest so that this can this dream can kind of be more likely to become a reality in the next like five, 10 years. I love that. That is so cool. And I mean, I'm hoping that maybe somebody listening to this could uh, contribute in some way to that. So if there's somebody that's like driving in their car, um, obviously I'll put all of your links and how to contact you in the show notes. But if somebody's like, all right, I want to either join her community, work with her, or I'm a, you know someone of the science mind that wants to support the mission that she's on, how could they uh, kind of quickly find you and connect with you? Yeah, thank, thank you for asking. So I have a, a few different ways that people can work with me. Um, I've taught three courses. I My my flagship course is Metabolic Mastery Mentorship, which is uh, an eight-module course with three Q&As. And it walks through all the circadian stuff and also just like major tenets of health. Like we go through gut health extensively, thyroid health, and talk about mold and, and fungal mm -hmm. overgrowth and all these types of things. Um, so that course just ended. It's not live anymore, but it's fully like self-guided now. Um, I also have a scientific literacy intensive course, which basically taught people. It's also self-guided at this point. It was live last year. Um, teaches people how to unpack scientific literature for themselves and understand like also the flaws in. Important. That's so right. freaking important. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. So I really wanted from my perspective to show like, okay, this is what I've perceived as issues with the way that science is conducted. This is how we could do better. This is how to unpack a paper. This is how to determine whether a paper is good good quality or maybe not so good quality. Um, so that's available. And then I also had a, a boot camp course that was basically walking through different protocols that I've offered through my business and, and outlining the basic science around each of them. Um, so there's that. And then I also just finished teaching a spring reset program with a good friend of mine, Cheryl Utah. And in there, we unpacked everything related to circadian biology and optimization, um, mitochondrial and metabolic health, as well as like um, just regulating your nervous system through things like breath work, meditation, just connecting to nature, um, just kind of really trying to center ourselves because ultimately, you know, circadian health ties into all of this, but our, yes. our how regulated our nervous system is, is going to dictate the quality of our life. And that is directly related to your light environment as well. So the more we can come at life from like a regulated perspective and a regulated like baseline, the better decisions we're going to make, the more we're going to be able to make intentional decisions in our life and and not let things just happen to us by accident um, that we're really going to intentionally kind of create the life of our dreams. So I just mm -hmm. finished that program. It's not live anymore. It's also just like fully recorded and everything. So people can purchase that, but we're also going to be launching like a three month container together. That's going to start early in May. So that if people want to nice. be in a live space with us, they'll be able to join that. I love that. And I'm so excited to, again, I'll let, put all these in the show notes, but just support you and um, watch where things go. I think it's going to be really exciting. And um, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for taking the time out to talk with me and, and my amazing community. Thank you so much. I've been a huge fan. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. I hope we can get to know each other better and I look forward to future chats. Absolutely. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Evolving Wellness Podcast. Again, if you are over on Apple or Spotify, go ahead and leave the show up to a five-star review if it was helpful. If you're on YouTube, leave us a like, leave us a comment. Make sure to get down to the show notes to follow Dr. Alexis, check out her programs. I know she has a podcast as well. She's working really hard to get this information out to more people. So let's support her as a community. And if you are new to the channel, make sure you check out my free resources over at www.sarahkleinerwellness.com under free resources and check out courses over on the courses page. 
As a reminder, this show is not medical advice and not a substitute for a one-on-one session with a practitioner who can look at your detailed, complicated health history and help you in that regards. So I hope this has been helpful and I look forward to talking with you next time. Thanks again for watching.